Every single week, I look at the news stories to try to plan these videos and figure out what I'm gonna talk about with you guys. And every single week, I keep seeing stories about the soft landing, the soft landing, that this is somehow something that's still going to happen. It can still be achieved, even at this stage in the game. And it's something I wanna discuss because it's kind of just another one of those big empty promises like we get from the government, right? Even though this is not a government promise, it's something that the Fed is trying to aim for. It's one of those things that we keep getting fed repeatedly that this might actually happen. I wanna kind of dig into this and see like why it could happen, why it might not happen, and also look at how much things have really gone up in cost because the cost of living for people has absolutely shot through the roof. I found some really good information on just how much the cost of living has risen since the pre-pandemic days. So first of all, the most recent inflation report just came in today as I'm shooting this video Tuesday. And guess what guys, it rose a little bit, okay? It's at 3.1% now. And so it went up 0.1%. Now, is that a huge increase? No. However, the fact of the matter is, the Fed has paused and has not raised interest rates since like the middle of 2023. And when we look at all the items that make up this CPI and subtract food and energy, it's actually up 4% year over year right now. So things definitely are not going in the right direction as of yet. But when I looked at the most recent CPI report today, I found a couple of pretty interesting things, like most notably how much fuel costs are down. It's actually down 28.9% year over year right now, which is a massive drop. And while that's great when you go to fill up your uh, tank at the gas station, it's also a warning sign because it means that demand for fuel is down worldwide. And the only reason that that could be the case is because the worldwide economy is slowing down. I mean, even here in Florida, like a month ago, I paid $3.79 a gallon. Now all the gas stations around here, I'm seeing $3.09 a gallon. And that's probably still expensive for Florida. I bet you most places in Florida are under three bucks a gallon right now. One of the things that matters the most on this inflation chart that still is not subsiding at any rate is shelter, guys. In fact, the shelter is still up 6.5% year over year and that is just too much you know most people haven't even gotten a six and a half percent raise and just when you look at shelter alone only shelter okay and think oh my god i have to pay six and a half percent more this year than i did a year ago well that already eats up any raise that people would have potentially have gotten right and so the increase of anything else is going to have to come straight out of their own pocket and it's not going to come from any sort of raise that it, they might have gotten through their job. Now the investors are constantly hoping that the Fed is going to cut interest rates as early as next spring. I think that's very wishful thinking and that's just it. They, they're hoping that that's going to happen but people need to realize that if the Fed were to cut interest rates as early as spring which is just a few months from now that would mean something is definitely wrong in the economy and that's why they're doing this. Jerome Powell comes out time and time again and says, you know, it would be premature to conclude with confidence that the Fed has raised its benchmark rate high enough to fully defeat inflation. And he's right, actually. Just because the Fed has not been raising interest rates for almost six months now doesn't mean that rate cuts are coming next. It could just mean that this is going to be the new normal of interest rates for a long time, especially since things are going so well for the Fed right now, right? They're, we have inflation at 3.1%, supposedly. We have job openings declining, which is what they want. You still see consumer spending out there, apparently. And so that's what brings us to this whole narrative of the potential soft landing, right? Because this is what makes people think that there may actually be a soft landing is this Goldilocks scenario that we just outlined. Yet, if things are not breaking in the economy, then what incentive does the Fed have to actually lower interest rates, right? Other than the fact that the national debt is being taxed to death with these higher interest rates, and that's a separate subject. But as far as the economy goes, that's not the Fed's problem. That's the government's problem. The Fed's job is to make sure inflation doesn't run out of control and they dictate monetary policy. And you know, last year, all these economists were saying that in order for Fed to defeat inflation, that we were going to have to have a recession. This would also mean unemployment goes up. But guess what? Falling inflation without accompanying a recession or job losses is historically unprecedented okay this has never happened before so think about that the fact that we've never actually had this soft landing or Goldilocks scenario happen in the past so is it gonna be different this time because that's the only argument for that moving forward is that 
This time is different. And man, have we heard that one a lot. And so far, it has been different. I'll, I'll give people that. It has been different, guys. Right? We have not ever really been through a situation this strange before, right? So this house is a fairly new listing. Four bedroom, four bath, almost 4,000 square feet. Pretty big house with a pool. Looks really nice in the pictures. But they're asking $2.8 million. And they bought it back in 2018 for $1.45 million. That is quite the appreciation. Even Redfin, who's usually bullish on prices of everything, is saying this house is only worth two. 2.7 and uh, yeah they're just probably asking too much for this house but hey let's see what ends up selling for their property tax bill is currently about twenty two and a half thousand dollars per year now the president of the Chicago Fed uh, Austin Goolsby he says that the United States is on track for the fastest annual drop in inflation ever on record and this could actually allow us to have a bigger soft landing than anyone ever thought and that's why you keep seeing these news stories constantly because people are getting super giddy about this potentially happening, this whole soft landing scenario. Pretty windy out here today, so I'm trying to avoid coming out by the water as much as possible because you get close to the water and then the wind picks up like crazy. So staying in the neighborhood is much better for you guys listening to this. But even with this whole Goldilocks scenario supposedly playing out, the Fed even admits that a soft landing is not a sure thing, okay? But the media is the one, you know, pushing this because a lot of investors want that to be the case because that would be the ideal scenario for the stock market and everything, right? But they say that if the Fed miscalculates and keeps interest rates too high for too long, it could eventually derail the economy and tip us into a recession, if you don't think that we're already in a recession right now. You know, I covered last week about how people are paying too much attention to the CPI and no one's paying attention to the GDI, which is the gross domestic income, which is not doing so well right now. And if we were measuring the economy based on that, then we would actually be in a recession. And Julia Coronado, who is the president of Macro Policy Perspectives, she says that there's more risk of a recession than a reacceleration of inflation at these current interest rates. And as we know, so far, the Fed is holding these interest rates pretty steady. And the longer these interest rates stay this steady, then the more chance we're gonna have of a recession coming into 2024. But you see, here's where this is getting tricky because if they don't cut rates, it's likely to throw us into a recession, just like Julia just said. However, if they do cut rates too soon, then inflation is likely to start coming back with a vengeance, and they're gonna have to start increasing rates once again, which is gonna cause all sorts of problems in the economy. And we know this is gonna happen because just look right now, guys. The federal funds rate has been steady for almost six months now, and we just saw inflation tick up a little bit as of the november reading but interest rates haven't moved so what do you think is going to happen if they start cutting you're going to see inflation come back and that's why jerome powell keeps saying listen we're, we're we're not saying anything about cutting rates just yet you know that's the news saying that they're not saying that they're going to cut rates the news is saying this so you got to be really careful when you hear things like that because once again people are saying things that they want to happen not things that are actually happening and rate cuts depend entirely on the health of the economy and so far things are booming right things are doing great and like i said earlier in that situation what incentive does the fed have to cut interest rates none so far and so it says right here in this story why would the fed start cutting rates sooner than later uh, a recession or a threat of one would likely prompt more and earlier interest rate reductions by the Fed. This is something I have been saying over and over on the channel for a long time now that people think as soon as the Fed starts cutting rates, everything's going to blow up, guys. The stock market's going to blow up. The real estate market's going to blow up. Everything's going to go crazy. But it says right here, if the Fed starts cutting rates, that's because we are in a recession or we're at a threat of a recession. Now the investor market, they're thinking that the Fed's gonna cut rates as soon as May of 2024, but that may not happen. That is just a guess 
from investors, and they have been wrong about a lot of different things about what the Fed's going to do so far. James Bullard, who is the president of the St. Louis Fed, he says that you got to be really cautious about these rate cuts because if you start the process of cutting the policy rate and then inflation goes back up, that could cause a lot of problems. And this is exactly what happened back in the 1970s, actually. And this is what James Bullard said as well. And if jobs and economic growth remain healthy, then perhaps rate cuts aren't needed anytime soon. Why lower the policy rate if the real economy is doing just fine? You might as well just sit back and enjoy the disinflation. Hmm, I kind of like that because this suggests that if everybody's so right about this economy right now and things are doing so well, then there is zero incentive to cut interest rates right now. And let's just leave them where they're at. That means we're gonna have 7% mortgages for a long time. It means we're gonna have high savings yields in high interest savings accounts. It means borrowing costs are gonna be more expensive on everything, which is going to make people think twice before buying things. So I think that's a good thing, right? If the economy's doing so good, let's keep these interest rates high. And realistically, they're not even high. Historically, they're not high. This is just a normal interest rate policy, really. So there's no reason to change it if it's working, correct? But let me ask you this, guys. If it's working so well, then why does everybody want interest rates to go back down so badly, right? Why? Well, because our economy got way too used to having low interest rates for way too long. And people basically rely on this now for their own personal financial situation. You know, people, look at people don't want to go out and buy houses because the interest rates are too high. Nobody wants to say anything about prices. Car sales are in the toilet because of high interest rates as well. And you also have more people drowning in debt more than ever because of where these interest rates are at because the higher the interest rates, the higher credit card companies charge you an interest, the higher personal loans charge you an interest, the higher any type of loan will charge you an interest. So a higher portion of people's incomes is going towards paying off this higher interest. So people don't want that, they don't like that. Here we have just an empty piece of land. They want $2 million for it. It's actually a land flip because they bought it back in 2020 for only 525,000, held on to it for a few years, and now they want, you know, what is that, six times more? This is insane, guys, but they probably won't get it. And the size of this piece of land, I kid you not, is smaller than just the backyard I had when I was growing up as a kid. But this entire lot is smaller than that, which is pretty wild when you think about it. And the property tax bill here is 14 grand a year just to have an empty piece of property. But here's the problem, guys. I suspect that if the Fed continues with this current trajectory and they just keep interest rates where they're at, like Bullard is saying, then it's only gonna be a matter of time before things really start to go downhill because look how much things have changed so dramatically with these higher interest rates. The housing market is in the toilet, guys. Demand has never been this low in like the last 25 years or something to buy a house. It is insane how low it is. The same goes for any other thing that people need to buy in this economy that requires people to get a loan, you know? The demand for it has gone down substantially because people can't afford items at these rates. In this case, something will have to give. Either it's gonna be interest rates is gonna have to give or prices are gonna have to give. And if the Fed decides like, yeah, well, things are working right now, let's just keep interest rates like this, then it's only gonna be a matter of time before prices start coming down to match where these interest rates are gonna be at if the Fed shows no sign of cutting them anytime soon. Makes perfect sense, right? And if the Fed does start cutting rates next year, they're saying it might not be until November of 2024, guys. That's basically a year from now. So that means interest rates staying exactly where they're at right now for at least another year. So people keep saying, oh yeah, I've been waiting for prices to come down, but they're not coming down. Well, you're gonna be waiting the same if you're waiting for interest rates to come down because it's not coming down. And let's face it guys, 7% for a mortgage today is still way too expensive at these prices. Nancy Vanden over at Oxford Economics says that she thinks rate hikes are done, but it's going to be many months before the Fed starts cutting rates. Her firm is not expecting the first rate cut until at least the third quarter of 2024. So this is just a far cry from what the overly optimistic, you know, betting markets with investors are thinking is gonna happen, guys. They keep saying, oh yeah, we're gonna see an interest rate cut by May. Like, 
Keep dreaming, guys, especially if all of this is supposedly working well right now and the economy is going great. These interest rates aren't going anywhere. Now, since we're on interest rates and the topic of inflation, I want to talk a little bit about how so many of us are getting squeezed financially from all of this. And Bloomberg did a great report about how much everything has gone up in price since the beginning of the pandemic, guys. And basically they determined that regular basket of goods that used to cost a family $100 before the pandemic now costs $119.27. That's basically a 20% increase. They said since early 2020, prices have risen as much as they had in the full 10 years preceding the health emergency. So think about that for a minute. Basically 2009 to 2019, and we had a huge economic crisis back then, prices went up the same amount during that time period than we saw just in the last few years after the pandemic. That is unheard of. They're saying groceries are up 25% since January of 2020. Same with electricity, it's also up 25%. Used car prices have gone up 35%. Auto insurance is up 33%. So it's no wonder that when people are polled about this economy, that they're not too thrilled with where things are at right now. They put together a bunch of these cool little infographics here that I'm gonna share with you guys. Look at this one right here. When it comes to hourly and nominal wages, you have nominal wages up 20%. That means people technically got a 20% increase in pay since the beginning of 2020 until today. But when adjusted for inflation, real wages are only up 0.6%, guys, which means wages are essentially flat. No one is actually making more money than they were pre-pandemic, but the cost of everything is through the roof. And a bunch of you guys commented in my recent video about how people are doing so well. I asked everybody to give their opinion on how well they're doing right now. And I saw a ton of comments in that video of people who were saying, hey, Michael, I'm making more money today than I was three years ago, but my quality of life is actually down. I still remember one of the comments that said, you know, I was making 75K a year pre-pandemic and life was easier and cheaper for me then than fast forward to today when I make 100K a year. So that's completely upside down, guys. In what world does that make sense where you got a 25% increase in pay over the past three years and life is somehow harder? That just goes to show you how much this inflation is taking a toll on people's monthly budgets. And the groceries are really hitting people, you know? The four years preceding the pandemic, grocery prices only increased less than 1%, okay? Now they're up 25% just in the last three years. Unbelievable. Look at that, we got coffee up 23% since 2020. Almost everybody drinks coffee and actually went down 6% between 2016 and 2019. Pound of ground beef now costs 523 on average, which is up from 389 in January of 2020. Fresh fruits and vegetables, that's up 14%. We saw the price of eggs completely skyrocket for a while there and it's kind of normalized, but yet it's still far more expensive than it was before. In October of 2020, the Census Bureau survey showed that a four person household spent on average $238 in a week on food at home. Three years later, the similar survey showed that figure jumped to $315, which is 32% more. They say food prices have only gone up 25%, but realistically, if you're feeding a family, it's gone up past 30%, guys. That's insane. And we just covered that nominal wages, even the amount that people are making, is only up 20%, which is not even enough to cover food. It's not even enough to cover rent either, because just in one year, it went up 6.5%. And when you compound that, the cost of shelter has risen obviously far more than that, because let's move over to housing, why don't we? Cost of houses, that's risen 42% since the beginning of the pandemic. So we all know that. We all pay attention to how much home prices have gone up on this channel. Rent since 2020 has also gone up 28%. But let's just take a step back, guys. Shelter, food, and energy. The big three things that people need to run their traditional American lives, right? So if the cost to buy a house is up 42% and the cost of rent is up 28% and nominal wages are only up 20%, there's a deficit there. If electricity is up 25% since the beginning of the pandemic, there's a deficit there. If food prices are up 25% since the beginning of the pandemic, there's a deficit there. So where are people getting all the extra money to pay for these things, guys? That's what I want you to tell me. Well, the real answer is they don't have the money to pay for these things and they're borrowing the money. That's why we're seeing credit card debt shoot through the roof right now. 
just in the last four or five months, it has gone up an extra 20% from 1 trillion to 1.2 trillion. And basically anybody who owned a home before the pandemic it was like winning the lottery. And I agree with that statement because if you owned a house pre-pandemic, you know, and saw that 42% increase in value, that's all free money that you just gained, free equity by doing nothing. But I think the problem is a lot of people see that, especially younger uh, would-be home buyers, and they think, well, that's the way things are supposed to be then, right? Well, no. You know, people see this, saw this 42% increase in home prices and think it's gonna go like this forever. Well, that's not true, guys. It's not gonna go like this forever. In fact, things are already starting to reverse in many different parts of the country where different cities and metros are down double digits year over year in home prices. Now, I know that's only a few places so far, but the fact that it's already happening is a sign that it's gonna continue to happen, especially if these interest rates remain higher for longer. But people think that it's all fun and games and all gains for homeowners. But the truth is, you know, homeowners got hit too because homeowners have to pay extra for everything as well. Homeowners have seen tremendous surges in property taxes and home maintenance costs, as well as homeowners insurance. These things have gone up exponentially for homeowners. So yeah, you might have gotten that increase in equity, but we see more and more people borrowing against that equity right now to pay for all the increases in the cost of living that we just discussed. Now, we already said electricity is up 25%. We also have natural gas bill, that's up 29%. People have record high car payments right now of $736 per month on average. And when I read this, it just makes me happy I don't have kids because as of 2022, the average annual cost of childcare nationally was almost $11,000 a year. And that's just the babysitter, guys. That's not talking about food and diapers and clothes and all this other stuff. That's just to have somebody take care of the kid while you're at work. As of September of 2023, the average monthly child care payments were 32% higher than in 2019. Then you got health care. The average employer-sponsored health care insurance premium jumped to about $24,000 this year. And about 40% of Americans said that they are delaying or skipping needed health care because they can't afford it this year. So things are really going well for people, huh? They even put an example of this one lady who was debt-free other than her mortgage going into the pandemic, and then things took a nosedive for her business, and she had to take out all sorts of loans in order to you know, keep her business afloat and keep her life afloat. And fast forward to today, she's now $75,000 in debt, you know, constantly shuffling money between credit cards with the balance transfers and all of that stuff, trying to avoid the huge interest rates that these credit cards are charging right now. You got restaurant prices up 24% since January of 2020. You have a recent survey showing that half the respondents reported not being able to afford going out to a restaurant and two thirds said that they can't afford a vacation right now. And this is also reflected in the comment section of my recent video about people doing well. We definitely have a bifurcated society right now where you definitely have the haves and have nots, guys. You know, some people are doing extremely well right now and have no complaints about where things are at and others are completely struggling. So it's easy to get caught in this world of dual realities when people literally have dual realities. You know, people are not living the same lifestyles right now. We also have the resumption of student loan payments over the past couple of months. That's making an impact on people's budgets. And if anybody thinks that we're gonna see prices of anything come back down to pre-pandemic levels you're basically dreaming guys now the only thing I think that might be possible for is home prices but that's even a stretch I'm not saying it's gonna happen but I'm saying it's possible if the economy takes a turn for the worse and we see unemployment go high enough and things get hurt badly enough we could see home prices go back to pre-pandemic levels that is definitely on the table but it would take a major recession for that to happen. So really people's only hope right now under these current circumstances is to just make more money, guys. Like there is no way to dig yourself out of debt right now or provide a better life for yourself other than just making more. You can cut your expenses as much as you can cut them, but that only goes so far, right? People can only cut their expenses so much and then there's just things you can't cut out. This is proof right here that the inflation is way worse than what we've been told all along and that the level of what this is affecting people's budgets right now compared to how much incomes have gone up 
is shocking, guys. And to be honest with you, even if we hit this so-called soft landing scenario, it only is gonna benefit the people who are already benefiting from this current situation, from this current economy, right? People who are struggling right now are not gonna benefit from any sort of soft landing. It's funny that people cheer things like this on and they want this to happen because you know, people just essentially don't wanna lose money. That's what it all comes down to. Investors don't wanna lose money. People don't wanna lose equity in their homes. They just wanna keep things going higher forever, which is not realistic with how much things cost. As we just looked at, as we see that people are not making enough money in real dollars to keep up with the cost of living today, there's basically no room for things to keep going up unless wages continue to go up exponentially as well. So. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't want to wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.